What's poppin', y'all? Welcome back to another episode of the Heliocentric Podcast. I'm your host, Pierre, Pee Wee the Plug, Andrees. And as always, everybody at home watching on YouTube, make sure you hit that like button for me. And if you're new and you enjoy this type of content, make sure you subscribe. For my audio listeners, wherever you listen to podcasts, whatever platform you use, head over there and give this podcast a five-star like and review. It is always much appreciated. Today, we got a mailbag episode. These are my favorite type of episodes to do, my favorite type of YouTube videos to do, even when it's not related to basketball. I love being able to dive in into what the community is talking about, what y'all thinking, what's on y'all hearts and y'all mind, and just being able to have the interaction to go back and forth. Sometimes I've done life advice. uh, We do basketball, other sports, content creation questions. So I love these type of episodes personally. Um, One thing I will say, though, in today particular, when I threw this tweet out, which if you're not following me already, make sure you stop this video um, or pause this podcast and head over to Twitter right now and follow me at Pee Wee the Plug. So the next time we do one of these, you're able to participate and potentially get your question asked or answered, excuse me, rather, on the podcast. But one thing I will say that made me extremely happy and proud, besides some of the people who are on Twitter to troll and get attention saying dumb or silly stuff, majority of the questions we got to today's tweet was phenomenal like i had to sit and really decide what questions i wasn't going to answer just because it was so many i know i can't answer 60 or 55 questions so i had to go in i'm a, i'm like yo p you, you chill you screenshotting almost every single question and you're not going to be able to answer every single one so usually in the history of that you have to really search and find the really good ones but today which I think speaks volumes on our little heliocentric community that we have. There was a lot of good stuff, like a lot of good stuff. We had college questions in there. Um, we had a question that we'll get answered in today that was about like, how would you, you know, if, if I have a kid, would I send them to AAU? Like real basketball stuff, not just NBA topics. And even the NBA conversational um, questions and topics and, and thoughts weren't like just the minimal stuff which I was just extremely blown away and proud of. So I appreciate everybody that threw a question in there. If if your question doesn't surface in the episode, um, don't feel away. Don't don't be discouraged. The next time, come with another question and it may be your time. I try to rotate and get as many people in as I can. Um, But, you know, like I said before, I can't answer every single one. We'd be here for five hours. Um, But I'm going to just dive right into it. I don't want to waste no time because we do have so many questions. The first one is from OG. TTW fam. So shout out to you, Zai Jones. He says, P, what do you think are the biggest discrepancies in the NBA love the pod? I appreciate that, my brother. Um, When you say discrepancies, the first thing that comes in my mind or comes to my mind is um, size, right? So growing up for me, when I was being taught basketball, size was something that it... We have to be honest. Size always mattered, right? But there was a certain point where it didn't matter too much. Because you were a bigger player did not always mean you were a better player. And I think that still stands in today's game. Don't get me wrong. But I just feel like when you look around the landscape of the NBA and you see the type of players that are being um, highly touted or or, or what scouts and, and coaches and GMs at every level is falling in love with, it's size. You know what I mean? You look at the Franz Wagner type of wings who are now 6'9", 6'10", which used to be a power forward or even a center. There's 6'10 centers that we've seen. Now they're asking for that, the wing. Brandon Miller is a guy who can play two and three, and he's about 6'9". You know what I mean? So, like, the size thing is is one of the biggest discrepancies um, and to me in the NBA. And even more specifically, though, it's that point guard position. Growing up, or not even growing up, but even when I was a teenager, you know what I mean? My early young adult years of of being in the NBA and watching the NBA, there was still miniature point guards or or small point guards. Like, you got to remember, Derrick Rose and Russell Westbrook, when they were coming into the league, was that 2008, 2009? They were considered bigger guards because they were 6'3", 6'4", big body frames who were real fast and strong those were big point guards and now in today's league you have legitimate Shea Gilgis Alexanders who are 6'6 Luka Doncic who is 6'7 
two what two thirty five two forty. That might be even be me being light. He might even be a little bit bigger than that. He's str stronger. But um, Anthony Black was just a lottery pick who was projected to be a, a, a lead guard whenever his time comes. Uh, Markel Fultz is six four six five. De'Aaron Fox. Um, De'Aaron Fox, excuse me. I always think De'Aaron Fox is 6'5". De'Aaron Fox is actually 6'3". I'm glad I call myself. LaMelo Ball, Lonzo Ball. Um, I, there's guys that I'm not even thinking of right now that y'all will be in the comments just spamming. And let, but when you look at when when I was a teenager or like the last decade, I'll say, there was Raymond Felton's, DJ Augustine's, uh, Kyle Lowry's. Like, that was common. Chris Paul's. It it was rare to see like a six 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 seven legitimate point guard. We had like Penny Hardaway before him. There was Magic, um, Jason Kidd it was a big guard at like six four. Um, who else did we have? Sh Sean Livingston before his injury. Those were big guards, and it was very like I said, very kind of rare. And then you had big guards being just stronger, faster, Russell Westbrook, Baron Davis, Derrick Rose type guards. Now we're legitimately seeing six seven six six. Just being thrown out there like nothing easy. Dyson Daniels is is a six six guy who was promoted or brought into the league as a guard. Kay Cunningham, like these jumbo guards are everywhere, and they're not just like we're taking shooting guards and we're just throwing them at the point guard. Like we've seen that when Phoenix did that with Devin Booker. No, these guys are being brought up and developed as point guards. Kay Cunningham has played point guard since I've seen him play. I've never seen Kay Cunningham play anything else. At Mount Verde, at Oklahoma State, at Detroit, with the Pistons, he's been a point guard. That's another big difference with, like, these guys being actual big point guards. We've seen guys be super tall and big, and the coach is like, hey, let me just put him at point guard. But I'm, I'm that's a different, that's a way different conversation than what I'm having. Some of these guys, Shea Gilders Alexander, I've always seen him be a league guard. It wasn't like, oh, my gosh, he was a small forward in, in, in high school, and they just converted him when he got to the NBA. We've seen that before. LaMelo, LaMelo Ball is a real point guard. Lonzo is a real point guard. And it's good to see Lonzo getting clear for certain activities and ramping up. Uh, hopefully, we can see him playing basketball. But, yeah, that would that that is my biggest discrepancy. It's like the size is starting to really matter. It, it It's always mattered to a certain extent, but it's never anything that, like, you you've seen anything being pushed out. These small guards – they're kind of being pushed out. You got to really have like a heart of a lion, Fred Van Vliet, Kyle Lowry, or you have to be extremely elite like Trey Young. And that's your that's your only way. You just won't survive. You just really won't survive, man. You really won't survive as like a legitimate guard. You'll probably have a job. You could probably be a backup or something like that. But the names that I named from the last decade, they were starting point guards. You know what I mean? Mario Chalmers was a starting point guard. Mo Williams, a starting point guard who made an all-star game. DJ Augustine, a starting point guard. Raymond Felton was a starting point guard on a Knicks team that went to the playoffs. These are starting point guards. Now, if you're like a Tyus Jones, 6'2", or something, you're backing up somebody. Trey Jones' highest ceiling is probably being a backup. You get what I'm saying? So it's like Monte Morris, backup. You're you're rarely going to you're rarely going to see these true smaller. He's a legitimate, you know what I mean. And it's good to see some of these guys in this upcoming draft class. Um, you know, Reed Shepard, Rob Dillingham. They're not the biggest. I mean, re, at least Reed Shepard is around what six two, six three. They're trying to classify Rob Dillingham as like a six two, six three. To me, he's probably six foot on the best day. So that's a, in, encouraging to see them having success and being talked about highly when it comes to the draft. So we'll have more. But then you got a Nikola Topic, who was a, a six six, and he's a point guard. <laughs> so it just goes right in back into the point of like the size is coming in, and at that guard spot, well, we've always loved steady play and the smaller guards who are quicker and can and can control the pace of the game. That they're kind of pushing that out the way. So that's one of the discrepancies that I'm seeing a lot. Just because I, I consider myself a basketball peers, so I'm always I'm I'm, I'm in, I love the Tyus Jones type guards all the time. That that's something I'm always going to love. But I won't lie, I love big guards too. That's always been my thing. My favorite player of all time is Kobe, rest in peace. But then it's Penny Hardaway. I love bigger guards. So it's a it's a it's a thing for me because it's a push and pull. I love the big guards, but I don't love the big guards enough to where we pushing the Tyus Joneses out of the league. 
and those are becoming far and few between. I still want to see some of those guys be able to run teams and be starting point guards and things like that without being outliers. You know what I mean? Like I don't I don't want it to be like you're either Ja Morant and you're a star who can jump over a seven foot three guy and dunk, or you're Trey Young who is 29 and 11 points. And you're running an offense and putting up these gaudy numbers, or it's just like you just you just a guy who's just gonna play 18 minutes a game because you're you're small. You know what I'm saying? So that's one of the biggest discrepancies. And then the other one is the shooting. The shooting and the scoring consistency. There's guys around the league who like we talk about these numbers and the high input of scoring, but it, you also have to realize that a lot of the guys who do the scoring are the same guys. They're like real legitimate scorers. Luca, Shea. They're the ones who are the engines behind these numbers getting up because they draw so much attention and they score so easily. But then you look at the rest of the NBA. There's just a lot of guys who are out here, and it's like one game they'll make a bunch of threes. The next game they can't make anything. One season a guy shooting above uh, average from three-point land as a 3 and D wing. The next year he's not so good. You know what I'm saying? Like, you have a guy have a stretch where, like, oh, my gosh, Dorian Finney-Smith has been shooting 44% from three this month. Then the next month, it's like, damn, Dorian Finney-Smith uh, can't make a shot. The, it, that's the discrepancy. It's so much, like, it's so much extremist with the shooting. You you have, like, the Luke Kennards of the world who are just pop, 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 and then they can't really guard. And then you have the Dorian Finney-Smith who's always going to be able to guard but it's kind of like give and take with the threes. And Dorian Finney-Smith, I'm not trying to use him as a poster child because I think he's actually the guy who's improved throughout his career um, as a legitimate catch-and-shoot option. But he's still one of those guys that teams will say, hey, let Dorian Finney-Smith beat us. When he was on the Mavericks, it's like we'll help and, and clog up as much of the pain as we can on Luka. And if Dorian Finney-Smith makes six threes or seven threes and we lose, we'll tip our cap and we'll just take our L. You know what I mean? And some of that is the role. Some of that is very it's, it's very hard to play a catch and shoot role where you're just sitting there in one spot. You're not moving. And the last resort is to kick it out to you and you just fire up a shot no matter what, no matter what is going on. You got the you got the main guy with the basketball dribble, 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 pick and roll, pick and roll until he can try to see if he can score. If he can, he throws it to you with three seconds left on the shot clock. And no matter how much the defense is guarding you or how much they're not, you have to shoot it. You just catch and shoot. And it's if it's. 50% contested, you got to put it up. If a hand is there, you got to put it up. If it's wide open, like, it don't matter. Once I throw it, you catch it, you shoot it no matter what. And that's a, that's a very tough job that a lot of fans, we don't really think about how hard that is to just sit there in one spot. Like, the P.J. Tucker job, it seems, in theory, like, oh, you make millions, it's just sitting in the corner. But it's like, if you don't deliver just that quick, you can be out of the lead because people are going to not value you. When in reality, the shot that you're taking is just not a high percentage shot. Because majority of the times, you're just standing in one spot for like 40 minutes in a game. You're going to the same corner, same spot, and you're just sitting there, and you have to make you have you have to make you have to make shots. So, um, those I would say are the biggest discrepancies for me. It's the size, and it's the the one or the other with three and D, and the shooting. You know what I mean? And I'm trying to make it make sense because I don't want anybody to get confused. But it's just so one-sided. We're like, if you're a lethal shooter, you probably can't defend. And if you can defend, you probably are not a lethal shooter. You're probably streaky. And then if you can do both, then we don't even you, we don't even consider you a three and D player. You're probably an all star. You're probably somebody that is hot. You know what I mean? Like we don't we don't really talk about OG Ananobi that way. We don't talk about Mikael Bridges those ways because they are more consistent on both sides um, of the basketball. So. Um, yeah, and then the main thing to me again, going back to the first part of the point that I made, is the size, especially at the guard spot. You know what I mean? But you see it everywhere. There's going to be at some point we're going to start seeing six ten shooting guards. I'm telling you, uh, Zachary Richardshaw is coming into the league. Um, he's going to be like a six eight six nine two, who is probably not going to put the ball in the floor that much. He's going to catch and shoot, and he's going to guard, kind of like Clay Thompson, but with two two extra inches. And depending on how old he is, he might still be growing. So he might get a you know a, a third inch, and there you go, a six ten shooting guard. You know, you see Vic at the at the center position, how big he is, and and Zach Eady, and all these. The size is just coming into the league. You know, Michael Porter Jr. is what a, a small four, six ten, six eleven. Kevin Durant was a rarity when he came into the league. That was rare. That was rare to see. Now we're just getting that constantly. 
constantly. Even if they ain't as good as Kevin Durant, it's just like, oh, here's a 6'10 shooter coming off your bench, knocking down shots. Like, what the hell? What What is that? So that would be the biggest dis- uh, discrepancy for me. Um, next question uh, from Ashan or Shan. I hope I'm saying that right. Ashan. Ashan. Difference between skill and talent. I don't have the definitions in front of me, but I'm going to just use what my mind tells me or what I think the, the difference between skill and talent. I think talent is being able to do something and not know why you're able to do it or how you're doing it. And skill is the exact opposite. Skill is I know I can make a left hand layup because I'm doing this and I'm doing that because of this, because I actually practice it. I have a skill because I put in time to build up this. You know, repetition is the father of learning. So I, I, I'm i skilled at left-hand layups because every day in the summer, I did 150 layups with my left hand um, at the gym. I worked on that. That became a skill. I put the time in. And so because I put the time in, I got the footwork down. I got the touch. I know the angle. I know what I'm looking for. I know when to do it, when not to do it. I know how to cup. You know what I mean? Like any, I know what I'm doing because I worked at it. To me, a talent is, shit, I don't know how I did that. I just did it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm just naturally athletic, so I don't know how I'm doing behind a backwards dunk. I just did it. You know what I mean? Versus, like, being able to explain it. There's certain people who can just do certain things in any sport. In any sport, any field, there's certain people who can just wait, who can just wake up and draw a, 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 a portrait of you, a flawless portrait of you. My uncle is like that. My uncle has natural talents with certain things like he can play instruments he can pick up an instrument and play things by ear he can't explain to you the note he's playing and why he's playing it and how he knows what to do because it's a it's a natural talent that he has he can draw something in front of him flawlessly without a without a flaw by pen but he can't teach you and explain man when I draw, I do this first and then no, it's just a talent that when he hits the pen and the paper, he can just draw something flawlessly. You know what I mean? Like I remember when I was a kid, my uncle drew me. Um, my uncle went to jail for like 30 days with like a tra- uh, tra- some traffic stuff. <laughs> um, but he had sent me a picture when Dwayne Wade and then the Miami Heat with Shaq won the finals. He drew Dwayne Wade holding the trophies and the final MVP with a pen though he drew it with a pen and it was flawless it was legit like i'm not talking about somebody who's just like drawn and they're kind of do- i'm talking about a legitimate artist with a pen which means you can't make a single mistake and it was flawless if i told him teach me how to do that he probably wouldn't be able to teach me how to do it because he's talented naturally at it he's naturally gifted at it and he can just do it there are certain baseball players who can just get into the batter's box and just hit 400 foot home runs then there are certain guys who are knowing what they're doing. I'm a I'm a perfected contact hitter who probably can't hit bombs, but I can hit it opposite field. I can hit it straight. I can hook it. I know exactly how to hit the ball because I put time in to practice a skill of hitting. But then you got guys who get in the batter's box. They don't know where the ball going. They just know how to hit it. They don't know how to guide the ball. They don't know how to – no, all I know is hit the ball as far as I can. You might have a certain hitter where you're like, all right, we got one out. We got to run on second and run on third. We just need a sack fly. We don't need you to hit a bond. Just hit a sack fly. And they might not be able to do it. Or it may be a shift. You see in baseball all the time for my baseball watchers. We've seen the shift years ago when they had the shift in. And you see extreme shifts for guys like Joey Gallo, guys who are extreme pool hitters. And I remember watching my dad like, man, it's unbelievable how these professional players, they can't just hit the ball that way. It's like if you just hit the ball that way, you have a walk-off single. And it's like, nope, these guys just get up in the batter box and they hook it right into the shift over and over and over because that's a natural talent and a natural um, ability versus a skill of saying I'm going in and I'm putting in 10,000 hours to be able to hit the ball directly to where I want to pinpoint it. Oh, they're going to they're going to shift it. Okay, well, now I'm I'm knowing to be a little late on a ball so I can send it opposite field. You know, what I mean, and that's to me the difference between. A talent and a skill. A skill is something that you worked on, you practiced, and you honed, and you got better and better and better, and you can explain how you got better and how you do it because you practice it. A talent is 
being able to do some shit and you can't even you don't even know why you're doing it, how you're doing it. You're just doing it. You know what I mean? And that can be applied to anything in life. I appreciate the question, though. Uh, we got F the goat double O. He says the discourse in Hornets Twitter is that LaMelo is no longer the franchise player and that Brandon Miller is thoughts. I think LaMelo is on a different level than Miller will ever be, to be honest. And I think he has displayed that before he was hurt. I think this is what happens when you have organizations like the Hornets who aren't that good. And because they aren't that good, all their fans can really do is just think, wonder and talk about the future and different things. I, I I think it's I think it's disheartening to say something like that just because number one that's so much pressure on Brandon Miller because I agree with you I think Lamelo Ball is an extremely talented basketball player and with all of the stuff that they were saying about Brandon Miller coming into the league why would you take him over Scoot yada 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 this and that which I always told y'all from day one was silly I hated the fact that they tried to act like Scoot was out of this world compared to Brandon Miller I didn't understand where that was coming from you can check my tweets my old videos. I said that months ago before I ever played an NBA game. I never understood that. And lo and behold, Brandon Miller is looking a lot more promising than Scoot. Still very early. A lot of time for both careers to go and whatever path they're going to go. But um, to the point is, Brandon Miller came in with a lot of pressure, a lot of scrutiny, and he's delivering and he's playing really, really well. And I think as a Hornets fans, they should probably just accept that they have talent. I wouldn't be trying to compare. I wouldn't be saying who's the franchise player, who's not. For all we know, it may be neither. You look like y'all heading into another lot lottery. What if y'all get the number one pick and then this guy that y'all draft in the number one? Or if y'all get another top three pick, what if this guy in this draft class is the guy? You know what I mean? At this point, I think fan bases like the Hornets should just be trying to accumulate talent and hope that they can play together. That's the beautiful thing because I believe Brandon Miller and LaMelo can play together. Who's going to be the guy? Who cares? Who cares? Just just be happy that you have two guys who could potentially be the guy. But I wouldn't trade out. I wouldn't trade on the mellow ball just just for the sake of conversation. I wouldn't start comparing for the sake of conversation. I would be happy that we're accumulating talent and I would be extremely happy that we have multiple guys who could potentially be the guy because that you want more chances than not. And the fact that you have another lottery pick coming and if you again can strike on this one, you then have three guys in the conversation who could be, quote unquote, the guy. And if they all can play together, man, even if LaMelo, if LaMelo is your second guy and Brandon Miller is the face of it, man, you got a really good team. If LaMelo is still the face and Brandon Miller is the second guy and his complimentary piece or his 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 rob into his Batman and you have a really, really good team. And if you take this up, up and coming pick that you're about to have this summer and you have him as the guy and LaMelo and Brandon Miller are complimenting him, then y'all future look very bright. But I think too many fan bases spend time on those those dividing conversations. That shit is dividing. You that That's just not what I want as a fan, and it's not what I would want as, like, somebody that's in an organization. Because it gets you, it gets you nowhere. In today's league, there is not any team where there's just one guy just doing everything and they're about to win the championship. It's just not. As good as Luka is, we always look to the Mavericks and say, man, he need help. They had to go get a Kyrie Irving. You know what I mean? Even with Kyrie, it's like, damn, you need some more help. Shea, we saw last year, was doing his thing. The Thunder won winning games. Now you add experience, you get a healthy chat, they look different. You know what I mean? Every team that you look around the league and they doing anything or you take serious, they have multiple guys. There is not going to be a singular it's just this dude and we just going to grind our way through it. Even if it's working in the regular season, when you get to the playoffs, that shit is going to come to a halt. I, I promise you. So that that would be my my piece on it. Who cares who's the face? Y'all suck right now. So neither one of them is the face. This is not anything where anybody should be the face of anything. Nobody's the face of the Hornets because y'all are terrible. And part of that is because LaMelo is hurt. But at, until until Brandon Miller is an all star. This team is belonging to LaMelo, um, in my in my, in my opinion, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. Um, the next question Kate, comes from Cade's attorney. <laughs> he has a profile picture of Cade Cunningham. He says, as one of the top seeds, where would you want to be seated to avoid bad matchups? Um, I wouldn't really I wouldn't I wouldn't care because I think in this playoffs, especially, I'm thinking Western Conference as well. You're not avoiding anybody in the Eastern Conference. I would want to be the one seed. You know what I mean? I want to play the Bulls or the Hawks or something like that. But on the West, 
you're going to play one of those bottom four, which is what Los Angeles, Golden State, Phoenix. You're going to you're going to play one of those teams. There is no avoiding anybody in the West. You're going to play somebody who is going to be who is going to be good, and they're going to have a couple of guys who can do some things against you. So I don't. Re- I think avoiding it, you would probably do more damage to yourself if you can just have high home court advantage, the number one seed. Then you should just take it. I wouldn't really try to do the manipulating of, of the seeding. So hell, man, we don't have to play LeBron and AD. But then you run into Devin Booker and Kevin Durant. <laughs> Oh, man, we don't want to run into this. And then you run into Steph Curry, who can single-handedly beat you, and the Golden State Warriors, who have a legitimate system. I, I don't know if I want to sign up for that either. So, to me, just play your best basketball. And unless you're resting, don't purposely try to fall anywhere. Because you're going to play, man, it ain't no, it ain't no ducking and dodging this year in the Western Conference. It's just not. And like I said, if I'm out east, I want to be the top seed like the Celtics and I want to play the Bulls or I want to play the Hawks and I want to beat those those either one of those teams in four games. Plain and simple. I'm not avoiding anybody out west because then I think what would happen is it would come back to bite you because you would try to avoid LeBron and AD and you'll probably get Steph Curry and he'll embarrass you. Or you'll try to avoid Steph Curry and then you get Devin Booker and Kevin Durant and then they embarrass you. So um, I think it's more about just trying to play your best basketball and and have the most confidence in yourself and your guys um, and take that into the playoffs. Because even if you have, quote unquote, avoid somebody that next round, you're playing a real deal team. That next round, you are playing a real deal team more than likely. So I say all that to say there is no avoidance um, or avoiding anything in the Western Conference this year. If I'm being quite frank, and in the Eastern Conference is the same thought process. Even if you're a Celtics team and you get matched up with the Bulls or the Hawks or something like that, and you handle them, that very next series you're about to get some real smoke. You're about to get some real smoke. So um, that's my thought press process on avoiding anything. It's a lot of parity right now. Unless we get we we keep getting injuries, I'm not avoiding anything to be honest with you. Um, I think the conversation is more on the bottom teams. Who are you trying to get as the bottom team? But then again, it's like at the bottom, you really just need to be focusing on making the playoffs. So um, JT Likes Ball says, fans can't get mad at players for flopping. It says flip, flipping, but I believe this is supposed to say flopping. Fans can't get mad at players for flopping and can play in the game and competitive at the same time. If a player finds a loophole that can get them easy points, then they should. Get mad at the league for allowing it, not the players trying to win. I agree with you to a certain extent. I definitely wholeheartedly agree with you. There's certain things like Harden where over the years when he was in his prime, he found a way to manipulate the rules. You know what I mean? Putting the ball low. You see DeMar DeRozan do it. Chris Paul do it. The little swipe through. Trey Young uh, stopping on his breaks and people running into him. Technically, that's a foul. You pump fake and somebody jumps. And so you jump into him on the way up and they affected your jump shot like DeMar DeRozan does. Technically, that's a foul. But I think the the thing that fans are going to get frustrated with is both sides. You are going to get frustrated. You're frustrated with the league that they're allowing it. But then you're also frustrated with players because at the end of the day, there's supposed to be a competitive nature and a competitive fire in you as the best of the best in the world to where even if it is a quote unquote loophole, I'm not exposing it because I'm so competitive. If that makes it like, for example, when I'm playing a video game, if I'm playing Madden and this one, there's a, I've never been the guy that's been the one play guy. I've never been that guy. I'd rather lose in Madden than win using one play. I'll just use my entire playbook or I'll, I'll have my favorite play. We all got our favorite plays, but I never could respect a person, whether they're playing me or I'm just watching them play, use one play. I'm going to use one play. And I might do some audibles here and there if you catch on to it. And like to me, that just goes against the competitive nature because that's some bullshit. You're manipulating the game. And at some point, you have to have a backbone and you have to have some balls to try to do something that is a little bit more competitive to the loophole. You know what I mean? A loophole is a shortcut in so many words. It's a shortcut. And I, there's just a lack of respect from a competitive nature aspect. For people that just try to take the shortcut, trying to take the easy way out. There's a there's a rap line. Babyface Ray, he's a Detroit rapper. He says the route a little the route a little longer when you out here being honest. And he meant it in a rap standpoint where it's like honest rappers, they have to work a little bit more harder because they have to really rap about their life. 
They have to really talk about what they're going through. They can't act like they rich when they broke. They can't act like they gangster when they not. You know, they really out here being honest. And you'll see it on the flip end where you got motherfuckers who don't have money acting like they're the richest people in the world. They don't own the chain. They don't own a watch. The car ain't theirs, which is all fine. But it's the fact that it's an act. And I believe that that's the same thing with the NBA. You know what I mean? It's just like it's a little harder when you're doing shit the right way. If, you, if you're just playing basketball and you're taking what the defense give you and you're not trying to be like a manipulator, you're not flopping, then it's like it's, it's going to be a little bit harder. And in turn, what happens is everybody starts doing it. That's why when people say, man, LeBron's a baby, he cries, he's flopping, he's acting, he's selling the car. I think everybody in the league is. I think that's just the nature of today's game where you have to sell your calls because if you are big, if you are strong and you show that it doesn't affect you, they're going to be prone to not call it. So you have to sell it a little bit. I remember being a Derrick Rose fan and it came out in one of the playoff series against the Hawks. They just weren't calling Derrick Rose fouls because they didn't think it it, it bothered him. He showed like because he wasn't like, ah. Oh, they didn't call it because he's so strong. He's just absorbing everything and they thinking he's not getting fouled. So now when you have that type of information, which is a fact, you can look those things up. This is a fact. Coaches, players, organizations are going to tell their player, hey, sell that call. Sell that call. And then in turn, you have shit that just looks silly. Now they're over selling shit. Joel Embiid is getting knocked down by a 6-1 guard. And then that's the shit where fans are going to be like, all right, Joel Embiid. There's a fine line between selling a call and, and finding a loophole because it's quote unquote the rules versus looking like a jackass. And I say that with respect because I like Joel Embiid. And I, I just think that Joel Embiid is so dominant that he doesn't have to do that loophole shit. He doesn't have to. And I think that's the fine line. I don't think fans are just doing it to bitch at the players. I don't think anybody is really going against you because technically, yeah, we should be mad at the rules. But at the same time, when you're the best in the world and you are dominant because a lot of these players are, why are we doing that? Why are you you're risking injury? Like sometimes Joel and B flops and I get scared like, oh, my gosh, don't hurt yourself trying to sell a sell a call. And it's like, is that worth it? Is are those two points worth you looking like a damn fool in the grand scheme of things? Probably not. And I think that's where fans get a little agitated and annoyed because it becomes part of people's uh, game. It becomes a part of who they are and how they're trying to play. And then you start seeing players fail and they don't have success because they're trying so hard to get the call then you don't get the call and you just pump faked and jumped and throw the ball up and now you just took a dumb ass shot and now it just affects the game in so many different ways so um that's my take on that I'm again I don't really disagree with you but I think when you add the context in and you just get to the point where it's like everything should have a middle ground that's it everything has to have a, a healthy balance and I think that's all fans really want uh, on both sides, the players and the loopholes and the rule books just have a healthy balance. Um, my guy, Miles Teal, he says, if you have a son or daughter that wants to play high level basketball, are you encouraged in playing AAU or the high school route? Seeing how AAU has a lot of drawbacks. I think the thing for me is whatever my child wants to do when it comes to basketball. It has to have a purpose. And that's just really in any in anything that I'm doing, whether my, my, my kid want to play soccer um, golf, basketball, uh, baseball. I was about to say football. I don't know if I'm going to be too, I don't know if I would approve football, but if you want to play any of those sports, all of it has an AAU type program, which is, you know, uh, constant off season tournaments and, and, and a chance to play. Like, you know, you got winter baseball, travel baseball, you know, basketball, AAU has just become so dominant or whatever, but I think AAU can be good and bad. The bad thing with AAU is that a lot of people look at it as exposure. I'm never going to put my kid in a situation where they quote unquote, we're, we're out there for exposure. I come from the thinking of if you can play, they're going to find you. I've never been a guy that was like, oh man, I need to transfer. There's some programs and certain things that can hold you back in certain environments. I get that. But I, I I remember going to school and being in high school where there was kids, man, man, I, I need to I need to transfer because the players over at that school, they get recruited. Uh, the players at that school getting recruited because they can play. You're not getting recruited because you can't play. It's not what school you it was school you at. You have to be able to play. That's the name of the game. You have at some point, even if you are on a team that is getting a lot of attention and by that attention, they're winning. And so let's just say an extra couple of scholarships are, are going that way. Because when you win, shit just comes your way, right? We see it even in the NBA. You win a championship, 
teams will start going out and paying guys from that championship team a bunch of money. We just seen uh, Bruce Brown get $22 million or $20-some million dollars practically because he won a championship with the Nuggets. He played a role on a championship team. So hypothetically speaking, let's say a state champion school, let's just say a couple of their bitch players who, who maybe are so-so, maybe they do get a couple looks because they were just a part of a team in one state. Eventually, though, when you get to that place that's giving out the scholarship, you're going to have to perform for what they're looking for. You, if you get, you get what I'm saying? At some point, you have to deliver. So I don't really care about exposure. I'm not a fan of all of that shit because e no matter how much exposure you get, if you cannot play, you will eventually get exposed. And when you get exposed, it's going to be a lot more worse than, than if you just didn't even get the exposure. There's no, there's nothing worse than a kid being put on that AAU platform. You know what I'm saying? EYBL and all that shit. And they, they do a little eye and they may not get a look and then they have to go play SEC basketball. And it's like, damn, what happened to him? He was killing the EYBL. He was doing his thing at AAU. And it's just like, oh, shit. He get exposed. How many times have you seen that? A guy that do well or they have some highlights at AAU. I won't even say EYBL, but they'll have some highlights at AAU probably because they dad or they uncle coach the team. They get to shoot up all the shots. The offense runs through them. They look a little better than they are. And then they go play some Division One basketball and you never hear of them again because they got exposed. They got exposed. That's the exposure you don't want. And so that's why I say, my child, we'll, we're going to have a plan and a purpose with everything we do. We're going to play high school basketball, and we'll play some AAU basketball if it serves a purpose. But the main thing is to become a better basketball player. That's always what I'm going to be thinking for my child. And even if it ain't my child, if I have a nephew, a cousin, a fan, if, if, if we all get older and fans of the show are like, man, P, come work with my son. And, and it made sense. I would, I would tell your kid the same thing I would tell my kid. What are we doing it for? If you look at the re if, if your in answer of why we're doing it is to get exposure, then I'm going to tell you then you're doing it for the wrong reason. Exposure is overrated, in my opinion. There's so many guys in the league that have shown you you do not need exposure at the level of like, man, I need to. Damian Lillard came from Weber State, bro. Weber State. And granted, there's not a thousand Damian Lillards in the league, but I think that's because a lot of people still think they have to go to Duke or Kentucky. I think a lot of people, and I think so many prospects, McDonald All Americans, high school players, they break their neck to go to those programs. And what a lot of those guys happen, or what happens, or what they realize, is that that conference or those players on the team, they're, they're just not ready for that. And so what they have to do is transfer. How many guys went to Kentucky or went to Duke? Thinking, hey man, I got a Duke offer. I might as well go to Duke because all Duke, all Duke produces pros. And then it's like, man, what happened to that dude that went to do? Oh, man, he done transferred. Now he goes to this school. Now he goes to that school. When it's like, bro, all you should have did was maybe go to a school that had better, had, was just better for you. You went to a school because of the stage, because of the exposure, because of the brand. And instead, I think kids need to focus on what school, what team, what program is putting me in a position to be the best player I can be and take my game to the next level. So that would be my thought process with AAU. My son come to me, my daughter come to me, I want to play AAU. Why do we want to play AAU? Because I want to get offers. That's not a good enough answer. That's not a good enough answer. We have to be the best players that we can be so when the offers come, we're ready to perform. We don't want offers to say we have offers. We want, to, we want offers so when we go to South Carolina, we're, we're hooping. We want offers so if we go to Rick Barnes at Tennessee, we're hooping. We, the transfer porter got this shit fucked up. The goal is it to be somebody who's transferring two to three times. I'm sorry. If you, you do what you got to do if that's the result. But it you the transfer portal isn't something that you look at as a plus. It's a, it's a negative. You never want to be a player that has to go transfer. I've seen it. I'm not going to name no names. But I've seen a player go to Kentucky, not look so good, then transfer and look amazing. I've seen it too many times. Matter of fact, I am going to name some names. Y'all remember Charles Matthews? Charles Matthews, he's from Chicago. He played at St. Rita. He's around my time. I think he's like a year or two younger than me. He committed to Kentucky at first. At Kentucky, he was uh, he went to Michigan, which ain't that. Uh, Michigan ain't no low mid-major shit. It's just a little stoop down from Kentucky. And he hooped his ass off at Michigan. He was a phenomenal player at Michigan and probably would be in the NBA if he didn't have 
a very unfortunate um, ACL injury during the draft process. He would have had some time or at least a shot at the NBA. I remember Ryan Harrell, years ago, Ryan Harrell was a phenomenal guard at NC State. NC State was a lower program, so he transferred to Kentucky. It didn't work. It didn't work well for him. It was too big of a stage. It was a lot of pros there. Cal, Coach Cal was on his ass a lot, and he just didn't fit that shit, and it kind of regressed him. And then he had to transfer there and transfer to Georgia State with uh, R.J. Hunter uh, made the shot with his dad, Ron Hunter, and um, my guy Ware, who uh, who 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 had the gruesome injury on Louisville. They both went. I'm going to sidetrack him, but yeah, it's like I like AAU basketball. If you're trying to get better. And that's what I think it should be. But AAU does have some bullshit because you have kids playing three games in a day. Which I just think is, I don't know, it's a lot of wear and tear and mileage on the body. Which is why I also think you have young players coming to the league with injury problems out of the gate. Because they already have mileage on their body before they ever touch a pro professional uh, court. You're supposed to get to the NBA and be fresh. <laughs> The mileage is supposed to come from the NBA. You don't want to mileage up your body and you ain't even got to the NBA yet. Not if you don't have to. There's first over. How many first overall picks have been hurt to start their careers? We've had an insane amount over the last 13, 14, maybe 15 years before prior. You know, the Derrick Roses and the Kevin Durant's and these guys, they used to come in and hoop. They used to get to it. <laughs> These guys wasn't coming in, oh, I'm playing 30 games my rookie season. Like, nah, hell no. But that's because now we have this AAU culture that is, even back then it was AAU, but this shit just took so much of a turn as the exposure thing and money and NIA, all this under table shit, these, these, uh, these shoe deals and programs. And it's becoming, it's, it's becoming more than player development. You know what I mean? It's just about getting games, getting money, getting exposure and all of that versus like I'm developing talent. And, that's my thing. I'm always for developing. At every level, you're trying to get better. Don't tell me you're going, I don't want to play with them so I can go get exposure. Exposure is overrated, man. Exposure is overrated. Exposure is overrated. You can be a professional basketball player from any fucking college at the Division One level. You, f- you fuck around can make it from Division Two. You light up Division Two and in your last... Two years, you transfer somewhere, you might can get it in there too. But the days of, oh my gosh, I must go to Duke, it's over. You don't have to go to Duke. Look at Dalton Connect at Tennessee. I want y'all to go look at where Dalton Connect played before he got to Tennessee. And now this dude is about to be a lottery pick. How? Where did C.J. McCollum go to college? Where did Desmond Bain go to college? Where did Ja Morant go to college? Tell me if those programs are league-producing programs. No, but when you can hoop and when you can play, they're going to find you. I guarantee it. They're going to find you. (laughs) I don't give a damn if you're coming out of fucking... Paul George went to Fresno State. Fresno State, y'all. Paul George went to Fresno State. Klay Thompson went to Washington State. Steph Curry went to Davidson. Am I making my point? I feel like I'm making my point. We can move on to the next one, man. That was a great question. That was such a great question. Um, Trav, who Trav? He says, what you think about DeJounte for Brandon Ingram in the offseason and what else would it take to make it work? Um, The two, the thing that pops in my mind first when you bring up that trade, I kind of like it. I know the Pelicans like DeJounte Murray, but I know the Pelicans also like Brandon Ingram. I don't know if they like DeJounte Murray enough to give up Brandon Ingram. The one thing I will say, though, is – what makes it hard for me to gauge on what, who would want what and how it would work is Brandon Ingram is on the last year of his deal next year, and DeJounte just signed an extension, so he'd have multiple years on that deal. I don't know how any side feels with that. I don't know if that complicates things or not, but at this point, I think the Hawks, if you can get a Brandon Ingram, Atlanta, go get him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But again, I just don't know how the Pelicans feel because right now we talk about the Pelicans a lot. But the Pelicans are having some success. They're a deep team. I know they like Brandon Ingram. I know they like Zion Williamson. And they're probably going to do everything they can to try to figure that situation out completely. And I think before they break those two up, you, we might see them try to put CJ on the block. Or they, we, they might try to take their young assets. Hey, here's Dyson Daniels 
and, you know, uh, Jordan Hawkins and a first round pick and they'll try to get a big splash. But uh, if if Brandon Ingram is going to be traded, it probably will be next year with the last year on this deal. So I'm preparing for that. But at the same time, with the Pelican success, it's hard for me to count on that as much as I used to feel earlier in the year. So we will see. Um, Teenage Millionaire, he says, who do you think is the best coach of college basketball right now? I got Dan Hurley. Dan Hurley is obviously not a bad <laughs> bad pick because of what the way UConn is is looked. Um, I'm a big fan of Jim Laranega at Miami. I, I really like Jim Laranega. Um, even back to the George Mason days when I was growing up, George Mason had a hell of a run one year that just stuck with me for the rest of my life. And that that type of stuff comes from coaching. Um, I look at Nate Oates at Alabama. I just think that the philosophy Nate Oates has fits to where the game and the pro pro game is going. And I think he empowers his players that way, which I think is why a lot of players have a chance at the NBA when they go there. You know what I mean? Alabama goes and they play a, they play a certain way. So you see a Brandon Miller um, is able to go to the league. Um, you see uh, my, Noah Clowney was able to go to the league. You, you have guys who are going to have chances to make it to the NBA and um, play a role under Nate Oates because of the way he he thrives uh, or the way he sets up his his uh, offense for his players to thrive and the way he breaks down the game and it's very analytical and it just fits the pro, ga- pro game. I think, I think he's had some hits and some misses. I think that comes from just, you know, recruiting and, and, and prospects um, hitting or missing sometimes. Brandon Miller obviously was a hit. Noah Clowney obviously was a hit. And then you have some guys that, were probably projected to do some things like that and kind of didn't. I feel like I'm also forgetting another Herb Jones was a was a play for Nate Oates as well and he was he was phenomenal um with that Alabama team. So I like I like Nate Oates a lot. Um obviously I like coach Calipari. Um I like Rick Barnes at Tennessee and the reason I like the guys that I'm naming is because I'm looking at college coaches to do a couple of things. Win obviously and be able to coach But I also take into consideration how your players look when they get to the league. And if you're developing players and helping players get to the NBA and have successful NBA careers, I'm looking at that a lot. You know what I mean? Versus like you just got a bunch of wins at the college level. But when your players get to the league, they not on shit. That's why I always like Tom Izzo. Tom Izzo does a good job of getting both. He has his players come in and help him win and and do good with his program. And I know Michigan State ain't looking too hot right now for sure. But the history of Tom Izzo is he's going to win and his players get to the league and they are able to be really good basketball players. They might not be superstars, you know what I mean? But like Draymond Green is really good. Xavier Tillman is good. I think Max Christie has some um he has some potential. Just gotta figure out um his spot with the with the Lakers or whatnot. Morris Peterson was really, really was really good. Zach Randolph. There's a lot of guys who went through Uh, Michigan State in turn and I'm not even there's a bunch of guys I didn't even name you know what I mean like um, my mind is going blank because there's so so many different things I'm thinking of right now but Tom Izzo I really really like and then also Jay Wright Jay Wright is another guy who obviously isn't coaching anymore retired but he coached Villanova he was one of my favorite coaches when I was growing up watching college basketball he made me want to go to Villanova and this is when he had Randy Foy um, Alan Ray for my young people yes there was a player who wasn't Ray Allen, but was Allen Ray. <laughs> Ray Allen's name backwards was his name, and he was really, really good, drafted by the Celtics. Um, and then Kyle Lowry. But then you look at now, Dante DiVincenzo, Josh Hart, Mikael Bridges, Jalen Brunson. Uh, I remember Omari Spellman had a little shot at the NBA. They said he could never get in shape, but he had a shot. Um, those are the coaches I like, coaches that can get both out of their players, and then rest in peace, Lou Olson. Lou Olson used to do a great job of that at Arizona, where Arizona could win, but he also produced a lot of high-level pro basketball players like Mike Bibby, Gilbert Arenas, Andre Iguodala, you know what I mean, uh, Channing Fry, like Lou Olson, Miles Simon, who now I believe works with the Los Angeles Lakers. Lou Olson used to do a damn good job of that. So those are the type of coaches that I like and what I look for when I'm valuing college basketball coaches, being able to win, but also being able to player develop and get your players ready and prepare for the next level, because that is ultimately your job. And there's some coaches in, in, in college who are damn good coaches, but they don't do a very good job of preparing their players for the NBA. There's a lot of programs, again, not going to say no names. 
But if you go and you take a you take a magnifying glass and you really look and you scan through, you're like, wait, this this coach, his teams are always winning. This school always wins. But they players get to the league and they really suck. This team has had a lot of guys get to the league and not do a damn thing. And that there's no way that that could just be a coincidence. Hmm. Um, and I think that happens in high school basketball, too. There's a lot of high school coaches who use players for the right now and try to get whatever they can get out of them to help the program in the current state. But me, I always came with the philosophy. If I, if I was ever a high school coach, I'm trying to do both. But I'm also prioritizing my player. I want my player to grow his game and it be better because I want to prepare him to eventually go on to play higher level basketball, college basketball. You know what I mean? Division three, II, division two, II, division one basketball. A lot of coaches are like, hey, you're six four, go play center. But it's like me, I would li- six four, if you you want to play basketball at the next level, well, we gotta work on your game. We're not just gonna throw you in the post because that helps us for the right now in the program right now. No, 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 no. The program has to benefit from you, and you have to benefit from the program. So we're going to work on your ball handling because I know basketball, 6'4", you're not going to be a center at no next level. I don't give a damn if you play Division Four basketball. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't care if you want to play community college basketball. There is no 6'4 centers just around here dominating, dog. We putting you on a perimeter. And not enough coaches do that. And I think it's the same thing in college. They're not necessarily 6'4 centers, but I think there are some guys where it's like, hmm, we should have you do this. We should try to have you do that to expand your game and get you ready for the next level because you say you want to go to the league. But it's a lot of coaches that are just like, oh, rebound. Go rebound. You're an energy guy. Go rebound. It's like, nah, man, that dude is 19. He has a lot of raw tools. If you put some time into him, he can maybe grow his grain and become an actual real pro. So that's just my two cents. Um, We got my guy Zach with no racks. How do you look at Jalen Green's season as a whole, and do you think he looks more fluid in offense as of recently? I think he's always had spurts throughout this year where he's looked extremely fluent. Then he's had dry spells when he's looked like he's overdoing it and trying to find his place um, and his footing. I think earlier in the season it was more acceptable because the the changing of the tides was happening with the Shingoon. And I think uh, at a certain point of this season, it was obvious that Shingoon was the guy. And um, when when you have a guy establish himself as the guy, everybody else has to kind of then reestablish themselves and, and get in where they fit in. And I think Jalen Green, because of how he's been prone to play basketball for all of his career, from high school to the G League to the early years at, in Houston all the way to now, he's programmed to play a certain way. So I'm giving him a little bit of a leeway because I do think it's going to take a little bit of time for him to accept the role because this is new. We have to remember the first two years or the first couple years of Jalen Green's career, there was no Sengun he was playing off of. They were just giving him the ball and letting him rock out, him and KPJ. And he was the guy. He was the face. He was the draft pick that was going to take them to the next level and be the staple. Sengun was a guy that kind of came out of nowhere and kind of took that torch from him. So now he has to refigure out where I am, where I can play off of this guy. I have to compliment him. You know what I mean? I have to figure out. His, and now, like you said, as of late, like the game against Portland, I really enjoyed for Jalen Green. He played off of Sengun real nicely, and he was able to get a lot of easy buckets. He got a lot of dunks, get out in transition as well. I think he has to get more into that. And then now, because the things I just named, that's easy for him. He just has to accept that and buy into that. But now he has to figure out himself in the half court when it isn't always an easy backdoor from Sengun to just get a dunk. You know what I mean? Um coming off those dribble handoffs and being able to make the right decision, being able to be comfortable giving up the ball, being able to eliminate some of those tough shots. He can make them, so he still should have them, but not relying on them and having too much of those type of shots in his diet. You know what I mean? Like those, y'all know those shots Jalen Green likes, those mid-ranges off of one leg fading away. He can make some when he's hot and he's rolling, but he has to know, you know, when when to and when not to and how to dial back a little bit. Because the efficiency is is going to be his his biggest thing. You know what I mean? And I think when you start to get a guy like Sengun, you have to worry about your efficiency because you're not the number one guy. I always think efficiency is overrated when you're the number one guy. Because no matter what, Kobe Bryant is shooting X amount of shots. No matter what, his job and his role is to be aggressive and to shoot. That's what your number one guy is. Kevin Durant, I don't give a damn what's going on. I want you to take 20 shots. You need you have to get that's a job. 
And a lot of people like scoring. They want to be the number one option. But when it's your job and no matter what you have to produce, no matter how the defense is playing you, no matter what their what their uh, philosophy is or their tactic or their scheme, you have to shoot 20 shots. Whether you're comfortable, uncomfortable, you feel hot, you don't feel hot, they double teaming. No matter what, you have to shoot 20 shots. People don't look at being a number one option as that. That's the number one option where your job is to score. And everybody just think it's like, oh, let's just put up numbers. I need to just do whatever the hell I want to do. No, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility. And that's those are the guys where I kind of dial back on the efficiency. People always try to be the efficiency police with Kobe Bryant. No, I won't. I want Kobe Bryant to shoot 25 shots. I want him to. Hell yeah. I want Luka Doncic to, to shoot the ball. Do not want a game where Luka is uh, he's one for seven. Oh, man, coach, I had a bad start to the game. I think I'm going to just pad. No, you got to. No, 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 no. You better go shoot some more. You better. I, I, I'd rather you be one of 15 and it'd be one of six or one of seven. So I think Jalen Green next step is that. And uh, I just want him to not be frustrated, man. I think Jalen Green can make things work in Houston. This, the rumors he's going to frustrate it. They, the both sides are going to frustrate it. They need to just <gasps> and figure some things out because there's enough talent and there's enough basketball there to go around. Because what happens with Jalen Green type players is they get frustrated and they try to run somewhere else to be that guy. And then you just you just then you just become the guy where they're saying you empty stats. Oh, I'm gonna go to Washington and be the guy. OK, that's re- that's really moving us anywhere you go. You're probably going to have to be in a situation where you're playing off of somebody. So accept it now. Learn from it and figure it out while you're here with the team that drafted you and will probably have the most patience with you. And then if any other time you have to part ways or whatever, you're already programmed and, and, and got a feel for it because the days of like, I'm the man and this shit is mine. I don't know. I, it's, it's hard to be that way in the NBA. Um, my, my boy Brian Guzman says, what NBA team could use a complete overhaul slash rebrand? That is a very good question. Um, I'm actually Googling teams right now and I'm going to look at the stands. What team could use an overhaul? You know what? I'm going to say that. This might be, this might, uh, you know what? There's a couple. There is a couple. The first one I'm going to say is the Brooklyn Nets. I think the Brooklyn Nets got to really just go in. Like they had, they need an overhaul and they need a rebrand. They need a new GM. They need a new head coach. They need a new direction, a new philosophy, uh, a new, a, a new everything. They need a new colorway. They need a new logo. They need a new, the black and white. It's too boring. They have the most boringest team in the world. There's no real solidified direction. You just had Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, and James Harden. Um, you're building around Mikael Bridges, who a lot of us don't think you should be building around. You build, you build with him. You 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 compl- you use him to compliment somebody, but you don't have the assets to necessarily pivot and go get a guy to compliment. Um. Yeah. It's just not it. So I, I would love to see them rebrand. They can still stay Brooklyn. Stay be the Brooklyn Nets, but take the uh, take the New Jersey colorway. Take the New Jersey type of logo. Take the new you know what I mean? Like I would do that. And then I would say the Raptors. The Raptors rebranded like a decade and some change ago. Or no, this is over a decade. This is like two thousand what? This is like two thousand I forget. This is way longer than a decade. But I remember when the when the Raptors the the certain type of logo and when they first had those those jersey changes with Demar um with those white jerseys and they, they just changed it up a little bit. They changed it up. I think they should change it up again. This is a new era. I love that they changed it with Demar and and and, and Valanchunas and those and Terrence Ross. But I think they should go back. They should go back to the purple dinosaur y type thing with, with, with Scotty Barnes and just start fresh. Even if you don't do exactly the nineties theme I would just again, like I said with the Brooklyn Nets, I would just take the colors because they got rid of that. That was so the the Demar Derozan era, a little bit after his era, they ushered in that new look where they took away the purple and they got they got rid of all of that. Because I, I, I don't even think Chris Bosh played in that in that uniform. I'm, I'm thinking of Chris Bosh in that one uniform, the old one, and they got completely rid of the purple and the dinosaur look, and it was just like the dinosaur hand or whatever and the red dinosaur. I would now go back to the 90s colorway, bring back the purple, figure out a new logo, and that would be my rebrand. And that, that was that was probably my two teams. And I look out west, I don't see anything out west that makes me feel like they need a rebrand. I like the Thunder, I like the Nuggets, I like the T-Wolves, Clippers, Pelicans, Suns, Kings, 
Mavs, Lakers. Yeah, I like everything that's going on out here. Um, it's hard to rebrand the Blazers. It's hard to rebrand. They always going to have the same type of regular degular. The Spurs, you know, Spurs are minimal. I think that fits them and what they like to do. So, uh, yeah, I'll go uh, Raptors and the Nets. Next question comes from BD Drip one k How far away do you think the Magic are from being legit contenders, and what trades do you think they need to do to be that? I think they need to trade for a guard that can create his own shot and score from all three levels while still fitting the timeline like Anthony Simons. Yeah, you probably watched my my re, my uh my series on 2K. That's what I did. I, I gave them Anthony Simons. I think in real life it's the same type of thing. On numbers on the board, we talked about places for D-Lo. Derek was talking about the Spurs, and obviously y'all saw that. Where I was like, oh, I don't know if he's a Spurs type of guy. If, if you're going to get a guy like D-Lo, you might as well just go through the draft. Yeah, you know, um... And, but the Magic came, for, came up for D'Lo. I like that, too. Anthony Simons, D'Lo, I think you get somebody who can score, somebody who can pass, and then you let, allow the defensive prowess from everybody else kind of offset it and balance it. But I like Anthony Simons for them. Um, they have assets. They have players. They have contracts. So they'll be able to make something work. As far as being legit contenders, it's about making those moves and then the growth of everybody else. Franz is, is doing this thing. Paolo is doing this thing. You still have Jalen Suggs, Anthony Black. Um, you have Jet Howard. You know what I mean? So um, this is a good start for them, though. It's a good start. But definitely in the next few years, two to three years, the Magic should be legit. And in that conversation, depending on the moves that they do make, because they do need three-point shooting as well. Who is your current number one pick in the upcoming NBA draft? I don't have one right now because it depends on who's drafting. We don't have a Victor Wimbiyama where he's just a hands-down number one overall pick. I know Alexander Saar. Um is, is gaining traction. Zachary Richardson is gaining some traction. So it really depends um, on who's drafting and who's the team selecting. That's going to be my biggest thing with who goes number one. Because, yeah, I like Alex Starr, but depending on who's drafting, it's like, do you bring him into those teams like a Detroit with Jalen Duran and whatnot? Like, I, I don't I don't know. I don't I don't know. But then if you're Washington, then you probably take Sar. You know what I'm saying? So it really depends on who who has that that the number one pick in his draft and with it. Um, Greco, I hope I'm saying the name right. He says Luca is entering a part of his career where individual stats are out of this world, but the winning part isn't up to par. What will it take for him to get over the hump and win some jewelry? I disagree. I think the winning part is there. He just hasn't won a championship. I think that's the biggest thing with like NBA fans. If you don't win a championship, people just say you're not a winner, which I think is bullshit. There's so many players who are legitimately winning players. Chris Paul is a winning player. He's won more in his league than he's lost. He just hasn't won a championship. Carmelo Anthony made the playoffs like the first 10 or 11 seasons of his career. That's a winning player. He just hasn't won a championship or never won a championship. You know what I mean? I think that's a big difference. I think we got to be patient with Luka. You know what I mean? Like, Luka is a really good player, but his team has not been. When Luka has a championship team and they fail, we should get concerned. That That's when you get concerned. When you have a championship team and we're all looking at them like this is the team and it still don't work. But I think we do we do this this type of conversation too much and it puts so much pressure on a player and we kind of contradict ourselves and we set them up because it's like, oh, Luca, you ain't getting over that hump. You ain't winning. You ain't you ain't you ain't up to par with the winner. And then Luca goes and requests a trade and he's like, let me go. Let me go to OKC. Let me go play with that hot team over there. And then now we all sit back and like, man. Luke ain't get it out the mud. He requested a trade. He, he 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 wanted it so bad. But it's like they do that because y'all say they're not winning. Kevin Durant went to Golden State because all the conversation was was him not winning. And then even if you do some shit like recruit players, and then they're going to say, oh, man, he had this guy. He had that. So it's just so much variables. I just say hoop. Hoop. Are you really thinking that the, the Mavericks are winning a championship? Because I'm not. I'm not. So I'm not really looking at Luca like, man, y'all ain't win no championship. You in trouble, man. No, I'm not. No, no, no. But if he can pull a championship out of his ass with this roster, then he's only that much great or greater in my eyes. You can be a great player. Every player is not going to win a championship, y'all. The more we accept that, the better the game will be. The less we accept that, the more these players are going to team up and everybody is going to win the championship, then the championship gets devalued. Oh, I'm going to go over here with him, and we both just going to win the championship. If the Clippers win a championship this year, Harden gets a ring, Kawhi gets another one, and then Paul George gets a ring. That's three three legacies get a ring added to it. Three. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that. that's what's happening when everybody is teaming up. 
which I would, oh, Russell Westbrook gets a ring too, which I wouldn't be mad at, but it's like, we're going to encourage players to do that more often. And then more younger. It's like, Hey, just go team up, team up, team up, team up, team up. Hey, I need a ring. You need a ring. Let's team up. Let's get this ring. So we can technically have our ring and solidify our legacies. We don't need to get the game to be doing that. We do not need uh Jokic and Luca trying to figure out how to team up. What the hell? That's so like, no. No, no, no. Unless it's just organically. You know, I like Dame and Giannis kind of organically came together. It wasn't anything where it was too crazy, but it's like still, do we do we need do we need Luca at this time to really be thinking about the fact that he hasn't have a championship? How old is Luca? 25? Does he really need to be sitting around talking about, "Man, I don't have a ring. What do I do?" What? Man, I need to. Should Luca be on the phone with agent? Man, get me over there with Wimby. No, but the more and more these conversations happen, and then the more fans nitpick at this shit with players who are twenty five years old, then the more these players are going to get on the phone with the agents and be talking about, hey, put me over there with Wimby, put me over there with Luca, force me over here, force me over there. I don't want that shit in the league. I like parity and I like the way it's going and I like to accept greatness however it comes. I like to accept greatness however it comes. Everybody won't win the championship, and that is okay. Ameka, he says, if you were building your NBA team from scratch, what position would you want your two stars to be? In other words, what's your preferred duo starting power? Uh, pairing small forward and small forward, park, uh, point guard and center. Love the content, Pete. Um, it's always guard and, and center. It's always guard and center. I just feel like when you have that dominant center and you have a dominant guard and they are able to play off of each other, Jokic and Jamal Murray, and people might not even say Jamal Murray is dominant. He's not even an all-star, but it works. Um, Tyrese Maxey and Embiid, they haven't done anything yet in the playoffs yet, but obviously it, it looks, this is the best I I've, I've think that this Sixers team has looked to me. Like when they was healthy, this was the best that it looked, and this is the most serious I took them, honestly. Uh, Kobe and Shaq, Dwayne Wade and Shaq. Like I love the guard and the center duo personally you know what i'm saying they don't always have to be a point guard they don't have to be chris uh chris paul and like a traditional center cr- traditional point guard but like a guard big i like it even if it was like brandon roy and lamarcus aldridge i like it damian lillard and and Giannis on paper i like it you know what i'm saying and even if you're not calling uh Giannis a necessary big he plays on the inside I like one so that's why i said that but i like i like that type of duo inside out it's a double threat i don't want i don't want outside outside Unless I have Steph Curry and Clay, you have to be the best in the world to do that. I definitely don't want inside inside. Then it's just twos and it's clogging and it's spacing and that. You know what I mean? I like guard and big. They can play together inside out. We can we can attack you from many different ways. You know what I'm saying? So um, when you have that, it's it's tough to really contain one or the other. You're trying to contain my point guard and you're trapping them off of the screens. You're allowing my big to slip and eat in the inside. If you double team my big on the inside, my 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 two or my one, whatever, my perimeter player is now having better looks to either sh- catch and shoot threes. Um, you know, even if I throw it out and you close out and it ain't just a wide open catch and shoot, he's just able to he's able to rock. It's gonna be hard to have your defense constantly rotating to stop my big on the inside and him kicking it back out to the perimeter for you to just keep sliding and sliding and sliding and sliding and replacing and no. Mismatches is gonna happen for e- for both sides. You're gonna be so busy trying to stop the inside, then now the double team that you're seeing is gonna have somebody who's not supposed to be guarding my my perimeter player. You're gonna be so so busy trying to stop my perimeter player that one on you, you're gonna allow my big to have one on one on the inside and he's gonna dominate that matchup. So give me the inside out uh, duo versus uh, anything else personally, in my opinion. Um, we'll do a lot a, a few more. I'm gonna run through these before we wrap up. Told y'all we had a lot of good questions, man. A lot of good questions. Um, Corey Prother says, is confidence the most important thing to have in today's NBA? An example would be the recent play of Jordan Poole. It looks like he is getting his confidence back after losing it for most of the season. Corey, I'm going to tell you this. Any sport, hell, anything in life, confidence is always the most important thing especially in sports and basketball. It's the most important thing. It's always been. It ain't just today's game. It's always been confidence. It's always been. It's the most important. I don't care how skilled you are, how talented you are, how good you are. If you're not confident, you're not going to be the best player that you can be in anything. If you're in a mall and you're at the food court and you see a girl that's cute and you like her, you want to get her number, if you go up there and you shoot that shot at her with no confidence, you're going to not get it. 
Confidence can turn a person who is a six or a five, they can become a seven or eight with confidence. Simply by having confidence. A, a poor free throw shooter can go to the line and make two big time free throws in crunch time because they're confident. A 90% free throw shooter could go up there and clank, clank both because they're not confident. Confidence is everything in the world, no matter what you are doing. If you are confident, you're going to have a better chance at getting it through. Because when you're not confident, everything plays a part. And when you're going to the free throw line and you're not confident, everything in the crowd is bothering you. When you are confident, you're so locked in, you don't even see the person in the crowd giving you a middle finger. You don't even hear a boo, yeah, yeah. You don't hear anything because it's just like, I'm so, this is not, nothing. But when you are, you're like, oh my gosh, you start to notice everything when you don't have confidence. My hands are sweating. You can see guys doing all this shit and stuff. Ah, my hands are sweating. Huh? What you say, coach? Coach ain't even say nothing. You so nervous, you thinking the coach saying something. Huh, coach? What you say? I didn't say anything. I said, go, go, go shoot the free throw. Oh, okay. It, confidence, man. Confidence. Confidence kind of put plaster confidence all over the place. You know what I mean? Like, if you're lacking confidence and you're watching this video or listening to this podcast, write confidence on a piece of paper. Screen, uh, take a picture of it and use it as your wallpaper. Every time you look at your phone, you see confidence. And make sure you have some. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Remember remember Uncle P telling you right now. It's, pro, it, it's, it's what? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's dance season or something? Y'all, or y'all probably just had turnabout. It's probably prom season. You're looking for a prom date? Be confident when you when you approach it. You going to you going to promise somebody. You want to have a good time. You're nervous about how you and your date gonna have a good time. Just be confident. If you don't know what to do, be confident. You run out of ideas. You don't know what to say. Whatever you say, say it with confidence. I don't give a damn. Whatever you do, do it with confidence. I'm trying to tell you, confidence will take you a long way. It will change your life. Um, Rob Fritz, which non playoff team do you expect to have the most roster turnover this off season? And what playoff team would be the most disappointed if they had an early exit? Boston Celtics. Boston Celtics, the best team in the NBA. If they lost in the first round, I would be extremely, extremely, um, extremely upset. Team with the most turnaround? Hmm, that's a tough question. There's going to be a lot of turnaround. I'm telling you now. The Detroit Pistons will have a lot of money. Watch the Pistons. They're going to have a lot of money. At the same time, they also have these young guys who I think like Cade is going to be there. Sasser will probably be there. Duren will be there. Will anybody want Isaiah Stewart on a trade market? He'll probably be back. Ivy could be back. So they got some guys that I think could be back. Um, but I think they also could have a lot of roster moves. Um, everybody else, I don't know, the Hornets. But they just traded for guys that contractually, I just don't see how they how any how they go anywhere. The most turnaround, uh the Nets could have done it, but if they were gonna do it, they would have did it at the deadline. The the Wizards, they have guys that I just don't I don't know the most turnaround. In the offseason, the Jazz, the Jazz make it to you to sell. They just make Clarkson go over here, Saxon go over there, Keontae, this is you. You can have the keys, John Collins. You go over here, uh, and we're just going to continue to open up the door for young players. You just seen the Jazz today. They signed Darius Baisley and they signed somebody else. Um, it's just like let's just bring young guys in. Who up, the other person they signed was young too. I forget, man. My mind is going blank. But the Jazz signed two guys today, and they waived Otto Porter. And the two guys they brought in were a little bit younger. So I think they'll continue to go that direction while also trying to have a healthy balance. But they definitely are prioritizing um, pr- prioritizing their youth movement. I <sighs> think we got a few. Damn. Yeah, we got a few. I got to hurry up. We got a few questions. Um, this is a quick one. Anthony Lopez, this was not going to make it because I just felt like I, I don't know what you were saying. But he said, instead of the Spurs trading every asset this offseason, why would they do that? Nobody has ever suggested that the Spurs, you know how many assets they have? They have so many assets that for them to trade every single one, I don't think anybody has ever pitched that. I'd say they trade any pick other than a projected third overall pick for Darius Garland. That right there is what makes it kind of 2K. You can't like teams are going to want in order to get in order to get you have to give. So, like, the idea of, like, hey, anything but our best pick, go out and get somebody. You got you to be a little weary of that. The other part of this is what do the Spurs have that Garland that the, that the Cavs would want for Garland? That's the other part. And you said at three, Alexander Starr. So, you got a perfect situation going on if you're the San Antonio Spurs and you're hypothetical. Alex Starr is there at three. Are we sure of that? Are we sure? Because he's damn near the number one guy, depending on what team. If the if a certain team that doesn't need him gets number one, then he'll probably drop to two. But three, 
at three, if you're hoping for Alex Sar at three, you're that's really a pipe dream, number one. At number two, you're then saying that Darius Garland can be had for your 11th overall pick because you're going to have two lottery picks, but the other one will be like what outside of the top seven, outside of the top eight. So we're like nine, 10, 11 for the Cavs, the playoff team. Don't know if you don't know if you're getting that, bro. Um, so, yeah, I just want to let you know to taper some of those expectations back when it comes to the Spurs. I, I, I'm just being honest. Um, my next guy, hopeful Pacers fan. You said that you've never been high on the Pacers on numbers on the board podcast. What do you think their ceiling is, and what do you make? Th- what would make them a true contender to you? They have to guard, bro. In order to be a true contender, you have to guard even a little bit, just a little. I'm not saying you have to be elite. I'm not saying they need to be top ten in both guys. I'm not even asking them that. But can you not be at the bottom? For every point they score, they give up. That's just really the mindset. They lead the league in scoring. They also led the league. They were leading the league in the points per game, giving up. You know what I mean? Like, that. that's that's their biggest downfall. I am encouraged with them getting past Galsi Yakim, though. I am encouraged with that and the, the trade that they used to get him um, because you still have, like, Jairus Walker, uh, uh, Nimhard, and, and other pieces if you want to make another move. I think the Pacers are, are, are treading in the right direction. You have Halliburton. You have Turner. You have Pascal. You have Matherin. Um, I think you have to just continue to push, continue to grind, but you definitely, in order to be a contender, you're going to have to be able to get stops. You're going to have to be able to get stops, man. You're going to have to be able to, be able to get stops. It's plain and simple. Um, Skion Sanders <laughs> says, why wasn't KD taken seriously when he called for the jobs of Steve Nash and Sean Marks? Because people, people just act like Kevin Durant can't say shit. Because he replies to people on Twitter and because he went to the Warriors, it's just like Kevin Durant is just like, Whatever he says, it just ha- holds no weight. You know what I mean? Which I'm not one of those people. When Kevin Durant speaks, I listen. He's one of the greatest basketball players of all time. He's never said anything stupidly as far as basketball in the game. He just did some things that a lot of people don't agree with. But that's life. That's life. That's life. He went to the Warriors. I wouldn't have. But that's what makes life life. If we all were like, hey, we all would have went to the Warriors. We all agree. This shit would be so lame. I would have no job. I would have no job if all we did was sit around and agree with everything we all did and all thought. I would literally have no job right now. A lot of us would be jobless. <laughs> um, my guy, Rondé Hollis Jefferson fan club. I, I can't read the rest of the name. It's get cut off. But he says, our peer scores, Cam Thomas, Jalen Green. I'm going to call you out on that. I don't know if they fit peer scores. Overrated by fans for their flashy skills or do they truly provide value to teams and when can you differentiate? I do think they I think scoring is definitely uh, is definitely a plus to a team. Teams need to be able to score. I think for them, they're the type of scorers that have to figure out where they fit into the scoring um, situation, because, again, these are not number one options where you're running everything through them. So they're going to be there to compliment somebody. They're going to be there to play next to a number one option. And when you play next to a number one option, you sometimes don't control the basketball. You sometimes have to take your shot attempts and cut them in half. Um, you sometimes, you know what I'm saying, aren't going to be the main guy. You sometimes have to space the floor and, and do things like screen and cut and slip. You have to be willing to buy into those things. There's a lot of guys who can score. They're not pure scorers. To me, a pure scorer is somebody who scores and do what they do no matter what setting you put them in. Kevin Durant playing with Kevin uh, Steph Curry, nothing about his shit dropped. He's still scoring. Kevin Durant in an All-Star game, scores. Kevin Durant in the Olympics, scores. Kevin Durant at Rucker Park, scores. Kevin Durant in high school, scores. Kevin Durant in college, scores. Kevin Durant at 40 years old is probably still going to be scoring. Carmelo Anthony, scored everywhere you put him at. These guys aren't pure scorers because that's the thing. If you put them here, are they still that? If you know Cam Thomas scored everywhere he went to, but he hasn't been a number one type guy in the NBA. Uh, the guys I named that I'm thinking of pure scores, even when they got to the NBA as young guys, rookies, teenagers, 20 points per game as rookies. Easily. Easily. Those guys are good scores. They're guard scores. They're microwave guys who can get hot and fill it up. But I think they have to figure out how how to play that role in in con, in conjunction with complementing somebody and playing winning basketball. Uh, and I think that's the difference maker. The difference maker is, can you play that role while helping a team win? Because it's easy to do that when your team is losing and there's nobody else on the team and you're just able to just do whatever you want to do. It's easy to do that. But how do you do that and then do it in a way where you're just winning? And like I said earlier, that type of player 
when you're in that role, you have to find out a way to be efficient because you're not going to have as many opportunities as the number one guy. That's just a fact. You go play with LeBron James, Jalen Green, you're not going to shoot 20 shots a game, brother. You go play with Luka Doncic, you're not shooting 20 shots a game. Cam Thomas goes to, I don't know, the Knicks. You're not shooting 20 points a game. Cam Thomas goes to the Wizards, he'll probably shoot 20-some shots. But then again, it's not going to be a winning situation. So um, that that that's my thought press on that. The last question from I am I'm Kedix. I hope I'm saying that right, man. I'm bad with names. Um, he says, I analyze basketball in a way where stats should be the start of a conversation that opens questions, but never the way to end an argument. How do you use stats while analyzing basketball games? I agree with that philosophy and that, that standpoint. Yeah, because those type of arguments are silly. Look, he averaged 25 and he averaged 22. He's the better score. It's not it's not that simple with stats. So um, I use stats with basketball to confirm what I'm seeing with my eyes or sometimes to show me what I should be seeing or what I should notice. So you'll watch some stuff, you'll see some things, and you'll be like, okay, he's really doing his thing shooting out of the corner, or he's really struggling right now in this mid-range pull-up. And then you can go see the numbers and be like, oh, damn, he's actually, that was just the two games I saw. He's actually been killing it in mid-range pull-ups. And it'll let you know, oh, no, you know what I mean? You got to look a little closer. or You know what I'm saying? Because honestly speaking, nobody's watching 82 games of every all 30 teams. That's just not the case. So you use the numbers and like that to help you and to help yourself. I'm not really looking at the numbers for an argument. I never look at a number and be like, oh, he's shooting. I'm going to use that for an argument. This is my argument. I'm not really watching to argue. I like conversation that progresses the game. And if it turns into an argument while we're having that conversation, then all be it. But I really just love progressive conversation about basketball because there's so many right answers. So I love the philosophy of how would you guard this? How would you guard that? How would you play this? How would you attack that? Because there's more than one answer. There's more than one answer. When you bring in the stats, that's where it kind of become the answer type thing. How many threes did he shoot last game? He shot 10. No, I'm looking at the stats. He shot 12. You were wrong. There's one answer for that. It's like straight fact answer. We have basketball is such an open game that the the dialogue and the discourse could be so many different ways. It don't have to be nerdy. We don't have to talk about sets. I don't want to act like NBA fans need to know floppy action and and, and you know I, I the Princeton offense. I you don't have to know that if that's not what you're in it for. But there's definitely a way to have high level basketball conversation that progresses the game. You know what I mean? I think the more knowledge that is passed along or that can open up different parts of your basketball brain can only be a plus. Even if you don't want to be a basketball nerd like me, even if you don't want to be as invested as me as a casual fan, the more you know, the more it only help you. You know what I mean? So I think that's what I'm looking at it for, for myself and for my own basketball mind. And again, in conversation, based off what I know, based off what I picked up on, obviously I'll use those things. And if they turn into an argument, I'll use it to support what I'm saying. But I agree with you. I never want to use a stat to just say, look, sometimes it is that easy. If you're comparing a 30 point score to a guy who's averaging 13 points, then, yeah, obviously we could see who's a better score. But sometimes, you know, you might have a guy who is shooting 36 percent from three and a guy who's shooting 42 percent. That guy might be shooting two threes a game and this dude is shooting seven. And the different looks, he's moving, he's off the catch. You know, it's all these different type of things. He might be getting his two threes a game, wide open um, percentile on wide open looks, 90, 95 percentile. The dude who's shooting 36 percent, his wide open uh, percentile is ninth. He, so he's shooting harder threes, more threes, but he's shooting a lesser percentage. The stat would say he's shooting a higher one, so he's better. But the information that we know with the context of the stat of why he's shooting 36 percent, Actually, he's better. But a lot of people, you have to actually watch. Thankfully, there is certain platforms and in, in different databases who are able to take these numbers and make the context for you. Because, again, everybody's not going to watch all 30 teams for 82 games. So you have numbers that can show you that, like, oh, a b-ball index. They'll show you the openness rating to the guy's threes. This dude was always open when he shot. This dude is always guarded when he shot. You know what I mean? So... That's what I use it for. But it really, I'm always, as a basketball guy, I'm always trying to use my own eyes and my own mind to put things together. And it's just to challenge myself. It's not to be a know-it-all. 
it because it's always something to learn, but it's just to know because sometimes you're in the gym and you're just watching basketball and you're not always going to have advanced analytics. And it's like, I don't enjoy being a guy that feels the need to need that. It's a good, it's a good tool to have in a time and place for it, but it's a healthy balance and then everything in life. And I think there's a lot of people who just solely live on that. And if we go watch a basketball a game together, they probably wouldn't be able to de- decipher anything or who's effective and why they're effective because they're just like, oh, shit, I don't know. I-, I don't have the advanced stats in front of me. But it's like, who-, who gives a fuck? You know, like, watch basketball. And then you have the shit to help you say, oh, no, I was wrong. He actually better going to his left than I thought. He's actually better finishing than I recalled. And that's how I use it. Um, I, again, I appreciate everybody who submitted a question and asked a question. This was probably one of my favorite heliocentric episodes. I'm extremely blown away with everybody's questions, even the ones that didn't get answered. Like I said earlier, really, really, really good questions, man. Really good basketball questions. Um, and this, this, these answers, these questions, these conversations that came up, they are exactly the, the poster child and definition or example of what I mean by progressive conversations. I said a lot of different things. Some people may disagree with, some people may agree with, but it progresses the conversation. So even if you disagree, you can understand where I'm coming from. You, that can make some type of sense to you. I'm not just out here saying jackass things or things that you just can't put your head around. It's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, I can see it the way I still would do this, but I can see, I, I, I can see that. And to me, that progresses the game. Because then when you do that, you may come back to a time you're like, actually, now that you say that, I, you're right. I may actually do that. And now you're progressed. Or you may, you may agree with me and you may throw an extra point on top of the point I made that I didn't even think of. And it's like, oh, shit, yeah, you're right. You can do that. And then now we progress and we both learn something and add something to our thought process or our basketball brains. And that's all we are able to do or should be trying to do because, you know, you just want to grow the game. So I appreciate y'all. Um, incredible episode. We what almost an hour and 30. Um, thank y'all. Make sure, again, you hit that like button. Um, And if you're new and you enjoy this type of content, make sure you subscribe. I will see you guys next week. I'm out. Peace.